go over that 1.5 degrees of warming, we're going to see some catastrophic events in terms of extended droughts, lack of crops, and there will be a huge pressure on um, climate migration, people trying to find areas suitable just to live in. So we have to think about this. 1.5 degrees, that's what we need to stay underneath. The second number, 11. That's it. 11 years. That's all we've got. Now, the, the group I mentioned er earlier, the IPCC, they're notoriously conservative, with a small c, conservative in their estimates. And they've come up with this a figure of 11 years. So we have to think. We must act now. There's no two ways about it. To the Paris Climate Accord, and we'll do everything to abide by those principles to make sure that globally we're acting together to tackle the climate crisis. Now, the issue is we can negotiate different parties, different people, different perspectives. We can negotiate between ourselves about how we reach these targets that I've mentioned, but what we cannot negotiate with is physics and chemistry. The science is set. It is the truth. The people on the street who are waving, clapping, cheering, you know, the people that haven't necessarily joined in this march specifically, but there's wider support in this area, gives me huge, huge hope. And I just want to say I think it's incredibly brave, especially for all of these young people, and I'm no way patronising you at all. It's incredibly brave, because it is brave to stand up for what you believe in, to take to the streets and put a mark down and say, I believe in this and I'm going to help to make this change happen. So I want to leave it at that. I want to give everyone a huge round of applause, but especially to the young people who are going to inherit this planet, and let's make sure they have a planet to inherit. Hey. This year, I was standing on this platform, giving a similar speech to what I was going to say now. But I can't say anything else than, well done. You are giving our planet a chance. You are giving us hope that we have a future because if we continue like this, we will. We can reach that zero carbon level if we keep doing this. If we send a message out to the government, out to the people, that we need to act now. There's no tomorrow, there's no uh, a week from now, now. We need to act now. And it's amazing to see the year 11s especially coming out in GCSE time. But what's the point of having an education if we won't have the planet to use it on? Great to see you all out here. We've got a message to send, so let's send it. Thank you. I was young once, a long time ago, and I wish today that I was Greta Thunberg, because she can really say what all of us want to say. I hope you all saw her video at the uh, US Congress uh, in America, and she, she says it exactly how it is, so there's not much more I can add to her. But um, I'm going to give you a little history lesson. I know you're all bunking off school today, so uh, you're going to get a little bit of history, whether you like it or not. Who likes history? Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. That's all right then. Okay, so what do we know? What do we know? We know climate change is happening. And what do we know? We know it's made by us. What we don't know is how we're going to stop it. And that's your decision, I think, today. So let's have a look at uh, a little bit of history. 2,500 years ago, a Greek philosopher said the goal of life is living in agreement with nature. Pretty smart guy, 2,500 years ago. In the 1200s, William the Conqueror established, established a law to protect the animals and the forests in the country. Pretty smart guy. We, we've forgotten that one, I think. In 1388, Parliament passed an act forbidding the throwing of filth and rubbish into ditches, rivers and water. So we are onto the right thread there, weren't we? We are getting the whole of it. <laughs> yeah. By 1820, the world population had reached 1 billion. So that's 1820. In 1862, John Ruskin, some of you might have heard of him, uh, wrote a book about the effects of unrestricted industrial expansion on humans and the natural world. That's 1862, folks. That's quite a way back. In 1874, George Perkins Marsh published a book called The Earth as Modified by Human Action, and it was the first analysis of the destructive impact on our planet. 
1865, the coal question was raised concerning the sustainability of using coal as a fossil fuel. By the 1930s, the world population hit, hit 2 billion people, and we had 5 million cars made in that year. Okay, nearly done. 1960, world population reaches 3 billion. I've got a little graph here. This is the last 10,000 years of human population. You can see we're peaking a bit. Uh, not much happened for quite a long time, and then we're almost off the scale. So, uh, not looking good in that front. 1968, some of you might remember this, Ray. You probably remember this. Um, <laughs> the Icelandic herring stock collapsed as a result of overfishing. But the good news was Friends of the Earth and the World Wildlife Fund were founded in 1968. 1970 saw the first Earth Day, but also 22 million cars were manufactured that year. In 1971, Greenpeace started up and now got offices in 41 countries around the world. Hey, thank you. 1972, world population reaches 4 billion. Things are going fast, aren't they? The Ecology Party started in the UK, later to become the Green Party. Yay! Hooray! Yes, the Green. <laughs> 1987, world population reaches 5 billion. Things are going pretty quick, aren't they? We're very good at reproducing, aren't we, actually? 1989, Exxon Valdez disaster, the world's largest oil spill in history. 1992, the first Earth Summit was held in Rio de Janeiro. That's 30 years ago we held an Earth Summit talking about climate change. And they also started the World Oceans Day. 1999, world population reaches tw uh, 6 billion people. 22 million cars produced every year, 20,000 aircraft in use every day. That's jet planes. 2003, we're getting close now, European heat wave results in the premature deaths of 35,000 people. 2006, former US President Al Gore released a film called An Inconvenient Truth. In the UK, the Stern Review was published under Tony Blair and it showed scientific evidence of global warming being overwhelming and its, con uh, and its consequences disastrous. That's 2006, folks. That's 10, 13 years ago. My maths is very good. Um, 2009, Energy Action Coalition hosted the second National Youth Climate Conference with 10,000 students present. That's 10 years ago, so they were marching then. 2011, population of the Earth reaches 7 billion. In 2018, the UK started fracking in this country. We're trying. Oh. Oh, very good. <laughs> We haven't succeeded yet. Hooray! Hooray! And we produce 70 million cars in the UK, so we're not slowing down very much, are we? So as of today, where are we? Uh, you, uh, the world population, 7.7 .7 billion. We're going to hit 8 billion soon. More than 200,000 acres of rainforest are burned every day. Um, and then the last 10 years have been the hottest on record since they began 100 years ago. So not looking good. Sorry to bore you with so many stats and figures. I'm here representing Scrubby School with my, uh, I'm Deputy Head Girl at Scrubby School and I'm just here to represent because in 11 years we're not going to have, well we might not, we don't know, we might not have a world to grow up in and you know, we're here to change our future, to change everyone's future and we want we want a world to grow up in and we're here and we're going to change it and we're going to do our best and yeah we're just Thank you. hello everybody something a little bit different here a lot of you may know me as a prominent green activist locally and today i'm going to speak on behalf of the quakers and tell you why quakers support this event today <laughs> First you, first of all, well done and thank you to all of you for being here. Right. You are putting your principles into practice. And that is in line with the Quakers attempting yeah, to integrity. You may not know much about Quakers, otherwise known as the Society of Red. But you probably know that we meet in silence and are strong advocates for peace. When we meet for worship, we are listening for the promptings of love and truth in our hearts. 
Many of us say that these are the leadings of God, whatever God is. Over the centuries since Quakers began worshipping, we have been led to act in certain ways, and this action we call testimony. I'm just going to show how all the testimonies which Quakers recognise today are inevitably linked to action on climate change. We believe that there is, there is a divine spark in everyone, and this leads to three of our testimonies. There's equality, because we are all of equal value, and also justice. Climate change goes against justice because it causes far more suffering to some than to others, and that mostly in the parts of the world where people are not well off. There's also peace, because we believe that killing people is wrong. And climate change fuels war by causing shortages of food and water, and war fuels climate change with its huge waste of resources, including fossil fuels. Just think of those recent pictures of the Saudi oil installations on fire. Simplicity is another testament. If we all live more simply, our climate impact would be less. For these reasons, and because we care about the whole of humanity and creation, we have recently recognized that we have a testament to sustainability. And Quakers in Britain have committed to becoming a low carbon, sustainable community. <laughs> Finally, we have always lived by the principles of truth and integrity. We don't say one thing and then do another. We try hard to be consistent in all aspects of our lives. These values can be upheld by people of any religion or none. And by being here today, you are acting them out. So I invite you to repeat... I invite you to repeat after me these values, if you believe they are yours. Equality. Equality. Justice. Justice. Simplicity. Simplicity. Peace. Peace. Truth. Truth. Sustainability. Sustainability. Thank you very much.